Hey, you guys, just a little note before we get into the deep dive at hand. I'm doing this deep dive a little different than how I normally do my deep dives, maybe a little bit different. This video might not be as edited as they normally are, and that is for a specific reason. As many of you guys know, Spooky2 is now a sponsor of our channel, Esoteric Atlanta, here, and I freaking love this company and they're running a special for the their 11th year anniversary and because we're we're almost at the end of this special i wanted to go ahead and make sure that i got this video out to you guys before our regular premiere time on monday because i wanted to make sure that you guys who are interested in perhaps purchasing the spooky two machines do get the best deal possible which for the 11th anniversary is nine percent off if you use the code happy bryce in the checkout for spooky two after the anniversary sale is over you will continue to be able to get a discount through my name, but it will only be 5%. So because we're at the tail end of their 11th year anniversary, I just wanted to go ahead and make sure that I got this video out early so that you guys could absolutely take advantage of this sale if you want to. All the information is down in the description box below. I will also place the video in the description box below where I spoke to Brad about these machines. But before we get into the video at hand, I am going to go ahead and play you a testimonial of the Spooky 2 just so you have more information. So if you want to take advantage of this deal, you can. I am so fortunate to have such great sponsors on this channel. Our sponsors, as well as our patrons, are the people who keep the lights on here at Esoteric Atlanta so I can continue delivering videos to you multiple times a week. I am so lucky to be a part of Gnostic TV, to have a SIA as a sponsorship, and to now be sponsored by the incredible Spooky2 company. Spooky2 is like a rife machine generator to help you in your journey through this human experience. If you want more information on Spooky2 and what it can do for you, there will be a video down in the description box. If you would like to purchase Spooky2, there are a few different discounts count codes that you can do, all of which you can, again, find down in the description box below. For the 11 year anniversary of Spooky 2, for particular products that are listed for the anniversary sale, you can get 9% off of these said products by entering Happy Bryce in checkout. For all additional products, the regular products, you can get 5% off by entering Bryce Watson when you check out. Here is a little clip of what Spooky 2 can do for you. Hi, John, Echo, and the Spooky 2 team. This is Kanika here, and I'm here to share not just my and my partner's Spooky 2 journey. Spooky 2 has been superbly special for my partner and I. I'm actually sitting in the scalar field. In our personal experiences, my partner and I have uh, literally gone off all our, our vitamin and multivitamin multivitamin and mineral supplements. We hardly take them. We used to take them to support and supplement our well-being. But I've been using the daily wellness protocol and my hair has just exploded in its growth. The skin's gotten uh, beautiful. The DH experimental frequencies, I've been experimenting with a lot of them. We have such good strength in our body. We don't fall ill to an extent that my partner has hay fever. Peter, he has hay fever, but this time, I've started using the immune super booster and oh my god it is magic uh, we recently this year purchased the remotes as well so we use our DNA clipping and we put our clippings in it and uh, it's just been so beautiful and profound and I have always been so I pray daily I meditate daily and I've been sitting in the scale of feel and meditating and praying and my psychic abilities, my connection to the divine, if I just want to put it in a nutshell, is just increasingly becoming so potent. I've been using the 12 strand DNA activation as well and the DH experimental frequencies just to see how it goes. And the, the effects 
are so magnificent in our, on our physical bodies and are like um, energetic field. I'm an energy healer. I take clients through um, quantum healing sessions while sitting in the field so that they can also, I can be a clearer conduit and send these energies as well by pure quantum entanglement, right? And if people were to not believe this, all this physical proof shows what a gem of a product this is. I can't like recommend this more to anybody like. So yes, much love and gratitude. Thank you for listening. And uh, I could share so much more, but I'd like to wrap this up now. Thank you. All right, you guys, as I said, this video might not be as edited as my videos typically are because I want to get this out by a certain time for that discount from Spooky 2. So please, please bear with me as we get through this information. As you guys know, we are on this massive, massive deep dive into the Romanovs of Russia leading up to the Bol Bolkovich revolution, Bolshevich. I always have a hard time saying that Bolshevich revolution. Russian is hard. Russian is a hard language. So you guys know what I mean, though. Um, Vladimir, Lenin, Stalin, those guys leading up to the USSR, the Iron Curtain, communism. And I was born under, I was not born under communism. I was born in America. Thank you, God. But I was born at the tail end of the Soviet Union. And, and when, the, when the Berlin Wall fa fell, I actually remember when it fell, I was really young. My dad called us into the um, living room to watch it because it was historic. So I remember watching the Berlin Wall fall, but I didn't really comprehend what was happening. And I do have a, rem a memory, which I think I've spoken about before, because um, I was in elementary school. And I remember um, after the Berlin Wall fell, uh, these kids from Moscow came over to our town and they performed. They did this like this uh, concert, this choir concert. And I have a visceral memory of these kids because I'd never seen kids so skinny. I'd never seen kids so dirty before. And I remember all of them had like holes in their clothes. And so, and I remember feeling just so bad for them. And uh, my mom was explaining like, well, that, that's communism. That's what happens. But of course, as a child, you don't really know what that is. But I, I have that imprinted memory in my head of, of these children that were my age. Now they're probably obviously in their 40s now, but just how different malnourished they look compared to my friends and me. As you guys know, if you've been with me for a while, I often say that history ain't nothing but gossip, petty gossip, but there's also a deeper purpose for history too, and that is so it does not repeat itself again, which unfortunately tends to happen all the time. And um, we started going into a deep dive into the, the Romanovs. We ended 2023 talking about Rasputin. Well, we're back there again. And I, I, you know, throughout this great awakening, I think sometimes we get confused and we think that they're good guys and they're bad guys. And most of the time, it's just shades of gray. Like two things can be true, right? Like the Bolsheviks could have been bad and the Romanovs could have also been bad. You know, like there's no good guys and bad guys. And we're going to lead up to the Anastasia Romanov conspiracy, the grand conspiracy. Did she survive? Um the uh assassination attempt when she was a child which that will probably be one of the last videos that we do but we have to really understand like if we're going to really talk about this and, and break this down and so many people believe that certain political figures in our world today are secretly you know romanovs and they're going to come in and save the world no you guys i mean i don't want no romanov saving me because they don't have a good reputation and um to rely on somebody else to save you is to rely on somebody to control you. And so this is why this is so important. I also want to just say too, that when I started to study the Bolshevik revolution, like 
from a different perspective. Everything that Vladimir Lenin and his compadres, his comrades, offered the Russian people is no different than what the 17th letter of the alphabet was offering us on the internet. So that's quite eye-opening and definitely teaches me a lesson and hopefully other people lesson to always take everything with a grain of salt because you don't know what the motivation is behind it. So with that being said, let's go into who who is Vladimir Lenin and who were the Bolsheviks. Now, if you remember a few videos back, I'll put those videos down in the description box below all of our Romanov videos. We spoke about Emperor Paul, Tsar Paul I of Russia. And Paul, to this day, is still, in my opinion, one of the most fascinating of all the Romanovs. He's definitely not the most famous. You know, we got Peter the Great, we got his mama Catherine the Great, we've got obviously Tsar Nicholas II, who we're going to be talking about, and his wife and his daughter and children. Paul definitely doesn't rank as, as a famous Romanov, but he is literally the most fascinating in my opinion, because in my opinion, out of all the Romanovs, he's the only one that's really showing signs of PTSD or CPTSD. The dude was obsessed with the Knights of Malta. In my opinion, I think he was searching for a family because he didn't feel like he had one with his mother. But, you know, that's all speculation because I'm not his therapist. I was not alive during that time. And that's just my speculation from the research that I have been looking at. But if you guys remember, Paul was assassinated in 1801, March 12th of 1801 by some of the nobles in his government of Russia. But before that happened, Paul had been going to this prophet that had been had spent most of his life in and out of prison. Now, this prophet was a guy by the name of Abel. And Abel kept getting himself arrested because he kept predicting the passing of a czar. You know, the first time he got arrested, it was because he predicted the passing of Catherine the Great. And if you're not familiar with rules around royalty, it is technically considered treason to predict a king or queen's death. I know, crazy, right? Because we're all headed in the same direction. Like, it's not like it's never going to happen. But nonetheless, those are the rules. And so Abel kept getting himself stuck into prison because he would say, hey, this is going to happen. And then he'd get arrested for it. And then what happened? So Paul started going to visit Abel and get information from Abel. Abel had previously told Paul that Paul would not live a very long life, which is true. He died in his late 40s. And he also gave Paul information about stuff that was bound to happen in Russia after both Abel and Paul were no longer alive. And Abel wrote a letter. He wrote a very, very famous letter. And he sealed this letter almost like a time capsule. We spoke about it in the episode with Paul. And this letter was to be opened by his descendants a hundred years later. Well, of course, those descendants or that descendant was Tsar Nicholas III, the last who would become the last Tsar of Russia. And so on March 12th of 1901, Tsar Nicholas II and his wife, Tsarina Alexandra, with great excitement, went to go read this letter. Now, the servants at the house, at their palace, their castle, said that they left to go read this letter with much excitement, much anticipation. But when they came back, they were downtrodden. And apparently what was in that letter was so eerily accurate that Tsar Nicholas II became paranoid and terrified by his own life. Now, let me just read you guys some of the predictions that came true that were in this letter from Paul. Of course, Paul spoke about Abel predicting the passing of Catherine the Great. Paul wrote how Abel had predicted Paul's own unaliving by his people, his noble peers, comrades. Abel also spoke about the Napoleonic Wars that were to come. He spoke about the burning of Moscow that was to come and did come. He spoke about Nicholas I's reign and the Decemberist revolt, which we did speak about over on Aquarius Rising Africa. He spoke about the abolition of serfdom under Alexander II. And he also spoke about the brutal, brutal unaliving of Alexander II. Again, that episode where we bridged Nicholas I all the way to Tsar Nicholas II 
um, is over on Aquarius Rising Africa. So I will tag that episode down in the description box below so you can kind of get caught up on all those details. But all of those things Abel had predicted and Paul wrote down, and they all had come true. They all had absolutely come true. And as I said, most of these things that were predicted in the letter, Abel nor Paul lived long enough to see that these predictions had come true. But what was this most scariest to, to Tsar Nicholas II was Tsar Nicholas II's prediction about him. It goes as follows. The holy Tsar, who is like Job, the long-suffering. Now, Job's feast day is May 6th. It's also the birthday of Tsar Nicholas II. So the holy Tsar, who is like Job the long-suffering, he will have the mind of Christ, the patience and purity of a dove, a crown of thorns who will replace his Tsar's crown. He shall be betrayed by his people as was the Son of God. A great war will be fought. People will fly in the air like birds and swim underwater like fish. They shall destroy each other with stinking sulfur. Treason shall grow and multiply. In the eve of victory, the czar's throne shall fall. Blood and tears shall water the earth. A peasant with an axe will take power. And the plagues of Egypt will begin. Well, obviously, the reference to a great war is that of World War I. People will fly in the air, it's airplanes. People will swim in the ocean like fish, submarines. Sulfur, I think you guys know what that is. It starts with a B, I can't say that word on YouTube. And of course, a peasant with the ax will take the power. That, my friends, is Vladimir Lenin. Vladimir Lenin was born on the 22nd of April, 1870. He was one of eight children. And I know that in my past... I have studied Vladimir Lenin before, but I guess there were things about him that I had forgotten. I guess in my mind, I had created this image of this man who had been born into very poor circumstances, and that is what instigated him becoming the communist that he became, but that is actually not true. This is what's so shocking about Lenin. Lenin was actually born into nobility. Now, what I mean by that, though, is that his father had worked his way up. So in the prediction from Abel, where it says a peasant with an ax, that is because, my friends, his father, Lenin's father, had been born into serfdom. And remember how... Alexander II, Nicholas the First's granddaddy, like freed the serfs. Well, his father had been freed. His family had been freed and served them. But at this point, when Alexander II actually freed the serfs in 1861, so so his father had been freed nine years before Lenin was born. His son Vladimir Lenin was born. And, and I know Lenin was not his birth na name, guys. I'm just going to say this real quickly. Like, he was not born with the name Lenin. That came later through his writings and his pseudonym. But I'm not even going to attempt to try to say his Russian name because my ass is from Georgia. And I speak English. So I'm just going to stick with the names that I know how to pronounce. And everybody knows who Lenin is. So I'm just going to stick with his the name that he's known historically by. But I do. I am aware that's not his family name. So let's just, let's just get that out of the way first and foremost. But Lenin's daddy, like Daddy Lenin, he was literally born a serf. He was born a slave, was freed in 1861, nine years before Vladimir's birth in 1870. And when the serfs were freed by Alexander II, again, Nicholas II's grandfather, they not they didn't just free the serfs. They like freed them and then like made them um, pay taxes, pay higher taxes because when you free the serfs, there's nobody on the noble's land to do the free labor anymore. So we got to take care of the nobles because they're not making the money they were making before the serfs were freed. So the serfs had to like pay it back to the nobles in taxes. Super screwed up. But nonetheless, that's what happened. So Vladimir's daddy... Papa Vladimir, Papa Lenin, worked his ass off to, to rise to a certain rank. He ended up going to school, becoming super educated, 
And through that, ended up marrying Mama Lennon, Lennon's mother, who herself came from a wealthy, noble family. Now, interestingly enough, her father, Lennon's grandfather, was a Russian Jew. He was a physician. He had converted to Russian Orthodox Christianity, but by birth, he had been born Jewish. And so that means that Lenin was a quarter Jewish. Now, who cares, right? Like none of us really care about your ethnicity. doesn't matter. But when we get into some of the politics when Lenin's in charge, like that's really interesting because they weren't so nice to the Jewish people. It's kind of like Hitler was a quarter Jewish too. So this is weird. Like this is just weird. But many people say that Lenin did not know that about his grandfather until like later on in life, which I don't know if I fully believe. I think we're pretty aware of our grandparents, at least maybe great grandparents or great, great grandparents. There might be some vagueness there, haziness there, but our grandparents, like I, I think, I think we're pretty, um, well, I think we're pretty uh, um, aware of our grandparents. So Lenin's born into this pretty wealthy family. His mother, again, comes from wealth. His father is a self-made man. He's not struggling. Like this kid is born with luxuries, with education, with parents who are wealthy enough to encourage his education. And oddly, like I highlighted this in pink, like stuff that I really think is very strange. I always highlight in pink. Oddly, y'all, y'all. His parents were monarchist. Like his parents supported the idea of a monarchy. They were not, they were the furthest thing from what Lenin would become. Like they wanted to keep the czars czaring. They believed in like keeping a conservative pecking order, which I mean, you guys, like, this is why history is so effing fascinating. It's so juicy. Like, what type of daddy issues and mommy issues is that for a child? I know sometimes we sway a little bit from our parents' politics because times change and we have a better understanding, all that kind of stuff. But to come from the nobility, to come from a wealthy family who are monarchist, and become Vladimir Lenin? What kind of daddy issues are those? Like, what was he? I would love to hear some psychology on this because, like, what kind of projection is that, y'all? Like, that's some juicy gossip. Like, dude obviously had mommy issues or daddy issues. We know he's got some issues coming up. Like, he had a brother issue, which we're going to, that really pushed him into this like madness of communism. But um, we'll get into that because in January of 1886, so Lenin is like on the eve of his 16th birthday, his daddy, Papa Lenin, dies of a brain hemorrhage had to double check that for a second it's a brain hemorrhage so just out of the blue he passes away now losing a parent especially at that age obviously is going to mess with you emotionally i think we we know more about how trauma works now than they probably did in the 19th century but especially if you're that age your father is very typically is the provider for the family and the mother is the emotional provider and stability so when one of the parents goes away either through passing away or leaving it can cause like an emotional instability within the child because they are not at their full functioning brain power at that time they're still children i'll tell you guys my dad walked out when i was 17 and that is when i um, had to have back surgery on my lower back which is right where mola moladara is the root chakra which is the right to be here so that makes total sense to me because all of a sudden the the in my family the the legs were kicked out from underneath the table for me and i didn't feel secure because the parents are supposed to be the security for the child so i i absolutely get that like he went through trauma when his dad died whether he was aware of it whether it was conscious trauma or subconscious trauma daddy died and so now that protector that masculine protector is no longer there around the same time 
because when it rains, it pours. That's how it always seems to be with everyone, good or bad on this earth. It just seems that everything kind of happens at the same time. So around this same time, old Vladdy boy, Vladimir Lenin, Vladdy, we'll call him, he, um, he had a brother, an older brother named Alexander. And Alexander had started going to university, as you do. And he got indoctrinated into some more radical beliefs because we're coming up, you know, at this time, coming up to at the end of the 19th century, coming into the 20th century, Russia is struggling. Like there is a lot of poverty. Of course, there has to be, um, as we've talked about before, there's this, this, this snowball effect of emotions because we have the nobility and the czars who are living in opulence. And then we've got the average person who is struggling just to feed their family. Sounds familiar, like what we're going through now. And so when Alexander goes off to university, these revolutionary groups are starting to grow. I mean, we already saw this with the assassination of Alexander II. Um, we saw this even further from Nicholas I, which would be his uh, Tsar Nicholas II's great-grandfather that there was the decemberist revolt so for about a, a little over a hundred years now ish there's been this underground growing tension between the common folk the 99 percent and the one percent and so we know in universities i mean nothing changed universities do indoctrinate so we know that th that there are constantly indoctrination groups going on and so Alexander, though, he gets brought into these these revolutionary groups like hook, line and sinker to the point where he starts to lead some of these revolutionary groups. Now, now keep in mind, my friends, that these revolutionary groups in czarist Russia are illegal. There's heavy censorship. You know, we've already had the Decemberist revolt. We already had the assassination of Alexander II. Like, there's stress to be a part. It's not like an after school activity where you're just going and talking and shooting the shit with your fellow poli sci majors. You know, like this is a literal threat to to the powers that be. And these kids are serious. Again, this is not some after school activity that's going to help them grow their resume when they're out hunting for a job. These kids are dead serious about what they plan to do and what they plan to do. Alexander, old Vladdy's brother, is instrumental in this, is called the 2nd 1st of March. So this was another attempt, we'll say unalive just to keep the algorithms okay, on um, Alexander III, who is Nicholas the first father so the son of alexander the second alexander the second who was successfully unalived by these revolutionaries they attempted to unalive alexander the third they had the b word the b-o-m you know what i'm saying um that they had created and they tried to do it on the same day the anniversary of the unaliving of Alexander II. And so they knew that Alexander III on that day was going to be going into the cathedral to pay his respects to his father. And so they waited outside on the street and they were going to basically, you know, do the deed. It wasn't successful. They got caught. And of course, that's treason. Of course, Alexander, Lenin's brother, his older brother, he was executed on the 20th of May, 1887. He was born on the 12th of April, 1866. So he was not that old. What, like 21 years old when he was executed for treason? The young boy, young boy. So, um, which I don't think that young should be because your brain's not fully developed yet, but whatever, that's, you know, I wasn't, we, we weren't, we, you and me, we weren't even alive during this time. So, you know, our opinions really don't matter because <laughs> it's after the fact. But, but you know, that really affected Vladimir Lenin as it would because you lost your daddy and you lost your older brother all in one big swoop. Again, your family are monarch. They're, they're monarchists. Like they believe in the czar, but their son was just removed, unalived for trying to unalive the czar himself. And the person that took your brother away from you, you know, 
I mean, your brother kind of took himself away from you by doing this, but nonetheless, the person who was responsible for signing the warrant was the czar. So I can see how someone like Vladimir Lenin at that young of age, that maybe his pursuit into his political career was more of emotionally triggered than politically or because he cared about his fellow man. No, I think it was very much instigated by his anger and aggression. He had, he had to take his anger and aggression out on someone and for his father and his brother. And of course his brother, there's an easy scapegoat, right? It's the czar. So he's going to take his aggression out on the czar. So the same year that Alexander was unalived by the czar, Lenin gets into university. This is 1887. He is going to go into Kazan University. Again, guys, not Russian. Hope I'm spelling that or saying that right. K-A-Z-A-N, Kazan University. And at this point, he starts to get involved into these groups. He starts to go, he starts going to these group meetings. And again, I, he starts going to these group meetings. And again, guys, I want to apologize. Normally, I don't like to look at my notes and do the video at the same time. I like to edit it and make it look cleaner. But because I'm on a time crunch and I want to get this to you guys by a certain time so you can get the discount, please forgive me for looking at my notes. So he gets into Kazaz University. He joins these student groups. He starts to get really involved in these activities, these anti-monarchist activities, joining these these new political ideologies like communism that's coming into communism. And he starts going to all these demonstration where he eventually gets arrested and gets exiled. Now at this point, from what I understand, his mother is not on a watch list, even though his brother has been by the czar and literally was a part of this extremist group. And now Lenin is also a part of this extremist group. The mom is still not on a, a watch list because the mom is a monarchist. She's a nobility. And so she's trying everything she can. And we're going to see this with his mother to get her son away from these revolutionary groups. So once he's arrested for being a part of these illegal revolutionary groups and he gets exiled, the mother steps in. While he's, and, she, and she's concerned, right? Because while he's exiled, he's starting to study more books like Karl Marx. I'm sorry, Karl Marx. Listen, listen, Linda, listen. Karl Marx was a raging narcissist who, who made his wife do everything for him. I would not be studying the politics of somebody who couldn't even get up to make his own dinner, that literally believed his wife was his servant. There was no equality in that marriage. Karl Marx was a piece of shit. And the fact that people don't study who these people are who come up with these ideas is very, very strange to me. Because if you knew who Karl Marx actually was as a person, you might be a little bit more skeptical of his politics. Because all Marxism is, is narcissistic abuse. That's all it is. It's just narcissistic abuse. But it 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 sounds good to someone like Lenin, right? Because it's totally different from this czarist empire. So mama is like freaking out. Mama is like, oh no, oh my God. And so she's, she's trying to pull strings to get Lenin on exile because she thinks if she can get him back in the city and doing stuff and busy, then um, he won't have time to be reading these books and getting these ideas in his head, you know, like the devil play, you know, what's it, what's it idle, idle hands, the devil's play things or something like that. Like, you know, he's, he's got time. He's got nothing but time. He's in exile. He's in timeout. He's in government timeout. So he's got nothing but time to be reading and growing and becoming even more extreme in his ideas. So, it, but it works because uh, his mom does get him an un unexiled and he's allowed to return to the city of his university, but he cannot return to school all right so once he gets back to the city he now officially is calling himself a marxist so even though mom is trying desperately to get him back involved in with kids his own age and back in some sort of life that does not involve him sitting around and getting these crazy ideas he's still at this point now he is like fully gone in his delusion and he is now a full-on marxist when he goes back to the city and he's calling himself a full-on marxist mama steps in again and mama's like, um, okay, I'm going to buy you a farm. Y'all, 
Talk about a spoiled brat. His mother bought him a freaking farm so that he would have something to do. She thought that if I get my son a farm, he can become a farmer and not be involved in this nonsense, this crazy political nonsense. Listen, Linda, if my mama bought me a farm, I'd learn to put overalls and chuck some hay. Like, I would absolutely thank you for buying me land. Thank you so much. I would love it. But no, 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 not little bratty, 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 vladdy. You know, he's like, no, I don't want to be a farmer. I want to be a revolutionary. So talk about a spoiled brat, my friend. So mama is like desperate. Like, I have so much empathy for his mom. Like, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if your child was Vladimir Lenin? Like, could you imagine? What? I would constantly be thinking, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? All right. So 1889, he decides to move with his family to a place called Samara in Russia. And this move with his family actually intensifies his political circles. Because in Samara, this is where he meets even more people in this world of these underground revolutionaries. He learned more pol political theories here that helped him shape his view. Um, at this point, the mother is still, again, in the background trying to save her child. So even though he hasn't been able to go to school because, you know, government said no, because he got arrested for being a revolutionary, the mother did pull some strings and got him to sit his exams, which I actually think is kind of brilliant. Like, if you can just go sit your exams, if you know the information, then you can bypass a lot of time. I think that's kind of a, a brilliant thing. Like, you know, we have it in high school here with a GED. Like, you can go take your GED and go on to college early if you want to. But, you know, for university, she was like, you know, my son's really smart, which he was really smart. His father was really smart. He comes from smart people. Doesn't mean he was kind. He was just smart. Um, the mother was like, all right, let me let, let, let's get him to take his exams, right? So we can get him a job. But yeah, that's what he needs. He didn't want to be a farmer. I've tried everything, but if we can get him to take, take his exams, he can actually get a job. And once he has a job, he'll be too busy to be a part of these little revolutionaries. And so he does that. He does. He sets his, in his exams. And that means that now Lenin is able to work in law. Well, of course, of course, of course, as fate would have it, in 1891, this huge famine swept across Russia. 400,000 people died of starvation, while millions more were massively malnourished where their health was never going to be the same again. The monarch was blamed for the slow response in this famine, and so the revolutionary groups grew even bigger. Now, 1891, let's think about who's on the throne. It's not Nicholas the II yet. It's Alexander the Third. He has got a few more years left on the throne. And if you guys remember Alexander III, Nicholas II's dad, because his father had been unalived and because there was an unaliving attempt on him, he like totally buckled down on censorship and control. So again, regardless of whether the monarchy was at fault or not for this famine and for the slow response to the people of Russia and their needs, they were blamed. So it doesn't even really matter at this time if they were at fault or if this was just something that happened. They were blamed. It was their fault. Okay. In 1893, Vladimir Lenin decides to move to St. Petersburg. Here he worked for a law firm. He gained a senior position in a Marxist revolutionary group called the Social Democrats. So again, we're snowballing. He's getting more and more and more indoctrinated into this extremist political group. And not only is he getting more and more indoctrinated into it, the dude is smart. And he's also in the profession of law. So he's learning loopholes. He's learning politics. He's learning how to navigate all of this. However, however, he does eventually get arrested. So by 1894, Vladimir Lenin is at this point being followed by the government. At this point, the government, even though he's been arrested before and exiled before, 
the government is aware that this dude could potentially be a problem. Now, maybe the government was more aware of him because his family was in good standing. Maybe the government was more aware of him because his mama was a noble. Maybe if Vladimir Lenin had been born totally to the lower class, maybe he would have been able to sneak around the shadows more. I don't know. Thus is history. But nonetheless, 1894, he is literally being followed by the government. This same year of 1894 is the year that Nicholas II takes the throne. And this whole revolution really ain't nothing but a face-off between Vladimir Lenin and Tsar Nicholas II. He also, at this year, starts to date uh, a Marxist school teacher by the name of Nadia. So now he's in this romantic, intimate relationship with a woman who actually, from my research, might have been a little bit more extreme than him. So, so he's just like... This is his world. This is the echo chamber that he lives in, which again, my friends, is why it's never healthy to be in an echo chamber. You always want to be around people who perhaps are going to challenge your ideas because you don't want to end up like Vladimir Lenin. But nonetheless, as the momentum is growing for Vladimir Lenin in this underground revolutionary group, he becomes like the president. <laughs> of of these these underground societies and he starts to publish illegal marxist books in 1895 because of this he is arrested 1896 he is exiled to siberia for three years in 1898 nadia his girlfriend joins him in Siberia, how romantic, right? And they're married. In 1899, he wrote The Development of Capitalism in Russia, one of his books. In 1900, his exile is over. And so he cannot live, he's not allowed to live in St. Petersburg. So he moves to a small town just south of St. Petersburg. Now, something that's super important that I didn't know because I don't speak Russian. <laughs> okay, so as all of this is happening, like as he's getting exiled, going to Siberia, all this kind of stuff, there are squabbling. There are squabbles, of course there are squabbles, that are happening in the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, which is his revolutionary party. So they split into two groups. One was the Men Menshevitz, Mensheviks, I'm telling you guys I don't speak Russian, and the second group is none other than the Bolsheviks. Guess which, which section Lenin was in? <laughs> the Bolsheviks, right? Duh, we know that. And the difference was, from what I understand, and I'm not a political science person, like I tell you guys, I'm not really into war history, but po poli-sci history is not something that's super fascinating to me. I really just want the juicy stuff. But what this means is the Mensheviks wanted and that means like less control that's what mensheviks means is less control and bolsheviks means more control that's what it translates to from russian to english so there you go you guys the mensheviks wanted less control they wanted even though they were communists and they wanted they wanted their and they're like ah, it might be a little bit too much like we might not we might not need to do that much control but the bolsheviks including vladimir lenin wanted the utmost control of the people which is so ironic like, it's so hypocritical. You want to get rid of the czars because you think they have too much control and they're bossing everybody around and they're, they're the czariest of czars, but you literally want to do the same thing. I mean, a little self-reflection might go a long way. We might not have as many destructive patterns in history if people just did a little bit of self-reflection. You know what I mean? All right, so 1900, exile's over. He's a Bolshevik. He's living outside of St. Petersburg because he can't go to St. Petersburg. So he's like in a little suburban town just on the border of St. Petersburg. And he starts to print a Marxist newspaper. But then, because he's smart, he goes, you know what? I'm going to get arrested again if I keep doing this. So he knows he needs to leave Russia. So at this point, he goes to Munich, Germany. In 1901, Nadia joins him. And in 1902, they move to London, where he um, writes a book called What is to be Done. And in this book, it basically says that in order to become a communist, force would be needed, you know, for the greater good. 
Now, at this point, they're living around Russia and Europe so that they can smuggle in areas where there's more free press. They can print these the, these pamphlets, this information, just like number 17 got on 4chan and 8chan and posted stuff for us. They would go outside of, the, of, of Russia and create these writings and then smuggle them into Russia. Pretty clever, right? Because they can't be arrested outside of Russia for this, right? But the people in Russia who are growing more and more and more fed up with the czars are eating this stuff up. And now one of the leaders of these revolutionary groups, Vladimir Lenin, is saying basically violence might be necessary, again, for the greater good. In 1904, Vladimir Lenin totally does a smear campaign on the Mish Mishkovitz and basically destroys them, takes them out, just like a narcissist, just like a narcissist. Take the, take the composition out, right? And now, by 1905, the Bolsheviks take total authority. In 1905, we also had another issue, and this was called Bloody Sunday. And I actually want to read from you guys from the New York Times um, on January 22nd, 1905 about this particular incident on Bloody Sunday. So on January 22nd, 1905, soldiers of the Imperial Guard in St. Petersburg, Russia, fired upon demonstrators as they marched to the Winter Palace to petition Tsar Nicholas II. So basically these people, these protesters, went to the Winter Palace to protest and petition Tsar Nicholas II for more um, rights for the people. The massacre would become known as Bloody Sunday, and it is seen as having contributed to the revolution in Russia that year. The European edition of the New York Herald devoted its front page on January 26, 1905, to coverage of the aftermath and the massacre. Here are a few excerpts. Trouble in Moscow. Tomorrow, January 5th, on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the founding of the university, students' riots are expected. General Volkov and the new governor of Moscow states that he will adopt the same rep repressive measures that are in effect in St. Petersburg. Troops have ceased using Cossacks are clearing the streets with whips. Prince <laughs> um, Sivtolpek Mur Mursky has resigned, but his resignation has not yet been accepted as it is difficult to find a substitute. The position has been offered to Prince Oblensky, who has declined it. Prince Oblensky is a member of the Imperial Council and was formerly a deputy governor of Warsaw and White. Also was uh, the uh, for, formal deputy governor of Warsaw and White also was offered the post but refused it. Most of the victims of Sunday's massacre are being buried tonight, but many families cannot obtain any information as the fate of their relatives. So I am going to, um, okay. Sympathizers parade in Geneva, a revolutionary and a socialist meeting are being held here every night. And there are processions over which red flag waves, no serious disturbances have occurred. Private dispatches relate that the frontier police are intimidated and, and, and access to Russia is easy now, even for those without passports, many revolutionists are taking advantage of this subscription list in favor of the strikers have been started by socialist papers, which attack the Russian bureaucracy violently. Aristocrat leaving town. And there is Nicholas II and his wife and his children. All those who are able to do so are now leaving St. Petersburg. The aristocratic part of the population is betaking itself either abroad or to his estates in the country. It is difficult to say how long the strike will last as the strikers have been furnished with money from abroad, chiefly from England. A part of this money has been seized by the government and confiscated. The correspondence of the Berlin Tagblatt, I'm sorry, the Berliner Tagblatt at St. Petersburg maintains that Father Gapon was wounded on Sunday. He asserts that he was present and saw the priest struck down. The government trying to remove the impression caused by the wounding of the priest is spreading a report that they are not really students, but police in disguise. It is further denied that the czar and his imperial family have any intention of leaving Tars 
our Zar Cow Saw. Z that's T S A R Zar Scow Silo. I probably totally butchered that because again, my ass is from Georgia, not Russia. In many towns in Russia, the portrait of the Zar has been removed from public buildings to prevent it being injured. On the other hand, the portrait of the Tsar, Tsarina is everywhere res respected, okay? So I'm going to put this link down in the description box below so you guys can see for yourself more about what happened on this particular Sunday in 1905. So Nicholas II, in October of 1905, delivers what's called the October Manifesto. Now, now because of the bloody Sunday because of this people in Russia are freaking pissed they are pissed and this of course leads to a weakened government so pray is a lot easier to hunt when it's weakened all right so now people are really starting to strike all over the country Lenin moves back to St. Petersburg at this time. As we saw in that article, revolutionaries were coming in like in droves during this time. Like I said, people didn't even need passports because the government has been so weakened by this. And Lenin starts to create a new newspaper called New Life. Now, in October of 1905, Nicholas II releases his October Manifesto, and this is giving into what the people want. He says civil rights would be given, a new parliament would be created that would be elected by the people. But guess what? He took it back. He took it back. He said all the things the people wanted to, to hear. He said them all, and then he took it back. He said, nope. I'm not going to let you elect these people into office because I don't like these people. And in 1906, martial law was imposed. By this time, we had someone by the name of Stalin, who you guys are all familiar with, who came after Lenin. But at this point, no one knew that this was going to happen. And Stalin was like, we need to be more violent. And Lenin was already pushing this idea of violence. And so um, by 1908, Lenin does go back to London. From London, he drops, he jumps to Paris. He's like, he's like a vagabond, just jumping around Europe. Same thing, trying to keep him safe, self safe and not arrested, while also helping his comrades build a bigger force in Russia to eventually take down the Tsardom. Remember that prophecy, the peasant with an ax. Now, in 1914, World War I starts. World War I was a bit of a turning point from the Tsar, but we're going to leave it there today because we heard about World War I again in Abel's prophecy. But we will pick up next week with World War I and this face off between Nicholas II and Lyddon Vladimir. We'll also go back and take a deeper look into Nicholas II's life, his children, his wife. Who are these two people? And hopefully start to understand that neither one of them were good and neither one of them were bad. And we ourselves, if we don't want history to repeat itself, have to start understanding that, right? One more thing before I leave you today, just something to consider. As I said in the beginning, a lot of the thing that the Bolsheviks and Vladimir Lenin were promising the people through their illegal pamphlets and newspaper were things that the 17th letter of the alphabet also promised us. Things that many, many truthers on YouTube are promising us. Things like free money, you're gonna get money. Things like houses and gold, like you're gonna be able to live under common law. And for a while now, I myself personally have been very uncomfortable with this idea of Nasara because there is no such thing as a free lunch. I do know that the banks in our world are corrupt, absolutely. But again, two things can be true. The banks can be corrupt and Nasara can also be a trick, be a trap and be corrupt as well. Nothing in life is free. And if you allow somebody to take care of you, you allow somebody to control you. So I'm a little bit suspicious that the whole truth or movement ain't nothing but another Bolshevik revolution that's going to bring us right back into the USSR, but worse. All right, you guys, as always, please make sure to do your own research and come to your, use your own critical thinking skills to come to your own conclusions, because if you're like me, you don't want history repeating itself.